Nobody was more responsible for making up the pathological criminal than Cesare Lombroso. Born in Verona in 1835, which at the time was part of the kingdom of Lombardy Venetia, Italy was yet to be united. He was from a wealthy Jewish family. He studied literature, philology and archaeology at the universities of Padua, Vienna and Paris before deciding in 1859 that he would become an army surgeon. Now this was the same year that Broca founded the Anthropological Society of Paris and Darwin published Origin. Coincidentally, these two developments, one in the science of man, the other in the science of life, would have a profound and dramatic impact upon his thinking. After learning his trade in medicine, in 1866 he was appointed a visiting lecturer at Pavia, then in 1871 took charge of a lunatic asylum at Pizarro. In 1876 he published his most famous work, L'Uomo Delinquente, Criminal Man, which paved the way for his appointment as Professor of Forensic Medicine and Hygiene at Turin. Eventually, in 1896, he was appointed Professor of Psychiatry and then in 1906 of Criminal Anthropology, a field which he'd done so much to shape. At the heart of Lombroso's work was the idea that criminals were an evolutionary throwback to primitive humanity in the apes. He called this atavism. Civilization had allowed these throwbacks to survive and then thrive as born criminals. They could be identified by anthropometry. In particular, their bodies, faces, skulls revealed multiple physical anomalies which differentiated them from the healthy and normal population. I always like to look at what Lombroso thought about tattoos. He'd go around prisons or look at the bodies of dead convicts or explore the research coming out of France and see that a huge number of the prisoners had tattoos. Some of these were sentimental, others badges of loyalty or love and more than a few were obscene. We'd be inclined to see these as evidence of the culture in which the tattooed lived, a consequence of their life circumstances. Indeed, another early criminal anthropologist, the Frenchman Alexandre La Cassagne, called tattoos speaking scars as an acknowledgement of the painful existence, the horrendous social circumstances, the poverty, the hunger, the unemployment that led to the conviction of many criminals. Lombroso, however, saw them as categorical evidence of degeneration. Only a person with a degenerate nervous system would be able to bear the pain of tattooing. A person with civilised sensibilities would not be able to undergo the operation. It would be so unbearable. To be tattooed was to be degenerate. This is symptomatic of the biological perspective that underwrote much of Lombroso's thinking. Indeed, he developed a criminal anthropology based upon his own understanding of Darwinian evolution and his detailed, sometimes exhaustive, observations as a trained medical man and psychiatrist. Now these had led him to believe that in the majority of cases criminals were born, not made. To be sure, he did allow for other types of criminal, occasional criminals, Criminals who committed crimes of passion, the group he called moral imbeciles, who basically equate to those suffering from moral insanity, and also criminal epileptics. But the basic thrust of his argument was that criminality, particularly the recidivism of the habitual criminal, could only be contained and treated. So the born criminal, the moral imbeciles, and the criminal epileptics were all subjects to be contained and treated rather than punished. If you were an atavistic throwback to a primitive type, then you couldn't be held responsible for your actions. And while you might not exactly be a psychopath, you were certainly a sociopath. But whatever you happened to be, your condition was pathological. Lombroso's work was not translated into English until 1900, but his influence was felt earlier than that. Havelock Ellis, best known as an early sexologist, of which more later, 
brought Lombroso's work to the English-speaking world when, in 1890, he published his first book, The Criminal. Ellis, like Lombroso, had trained in medicine, although he never practised it. However, his ideas were deeply influential. The Criminal was heavily indebted to Luomo Delinquente, although it was also influenced by Lombroso's protégé, Enrico Ferri, who developed an etiology of crime that was less pathological and more social and cultural, although he didn't eschew biological causation altogether. Ellis followed Lombroso's typology closely, but merged the atavistic criminal and the moral imbeciles into a single group, the instinctive criminal, a type that he called a moral monster. In him, he continued, the absence of guiding or inhibiting social instincts is accompanied by unusual development of the sensual and self-seeking impulses. Ellis saw three overlapping and relational causes of crime. Cosmic, which consisted of all the influences of the external inorganic world, including the idea that the weather, particularly hot weather and diet, might influence crime. Biological, which he divided into atavistic, atypic or morbid. I take atypic to mean something like a sport or mutation, and morbid to be the result of dynamic disease. And finally, the social. However, for Ellis, it wasn't all about biology and heredity. Like Adolf Ketele, one of the founders of statistics and sociology, and the aforementioned La Cassagne, he placed a great deal of weight on the last category, the social environment. Here, he approvingly quoted La Cassagne, who had said, every society has the criminals that it deserves. All the same, Ellis was a firm believer that all three causes of crime could intertwine to create the criminal. It is said that Lombroso's ideas were not influential in a European context. That is debatable. But once Criminal Man had been published in English, many of his ideas were taken up with alacrity by the eugenics movement, which was deeply influenced by neo-Mendelianism. Indeed, when we look at the work of Henry Goddard, of Calicat family fame, we see the coming together of the mind sciences to create the biologically degenerate, of which criminality was just one, albeit one incredibly important aspect. Here I direct you to modules on eugenics that I've made for Darwinism, which will give you an idea of the significance and impact of the emergence of the biological degenerate. So, what should we take away from this? Firstly, psychiatry was deeply involved in defining what criminality was, and it made demands for its treatment and containment. Secondly, this was part of the original push that would result in the creation of the psychopath, a figure whose behaviour, if we accept John Ronson's journalistic account, which incidentally I do with one or two reservations, which bears remarkable similarity to individuals diagnosed as suffering from moral insanity in the 19th century. Thirdly, in being instrumental in the creation of the criminal mind and the psychopath, psychiatry was implicated in making up a kind of person. My question to you is what other types of people has psychiatry been involved in the making up of? And with that ugly sentence, complete with dangling prepositions, I finished this module.